No, thanks so much, Mike, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to to be here. It's the first one of these that uh, that I've done, and as uh, as Mike said, I've uh, I've stepped out of police, and now I've uh, I've retired. Um, I did my thirty years as a police officer, and uh, I've now decided um, to carry on working. Um, so we shall see where that takes us. Um, I had I had some thoughts initially on on what to call the presentation and. The majority of my last few years has been around uh, digital forensics and a, a number of lessons uh, that have perhaps been learnt and uh, different insights. And initially, I put it as a new discipline to uncover the truth of an incident. Um, and upon reflection, I don't think that's particularly accurate because I think drone forensics has been around for for some time now, certainly since I started doing it in 2015. But I think we. I get the feeling we're still slightly behind the curve, um, certainly from from some of the stuff that I've seen. Um, so, one of the you know points on that, and and certainly the idea of uh, uh, these conferences is collaboration. I'm a a real advocate in uh, collaborating with people to make sure that we're all kind of benefiting from from each other's experience. And there's there's a number of people on the call here this morning that I've had the um, the pleasure of getting to know and, and work with. And I think without those brains and characters and what have you, I don't think the industry would would be where it is today. So um, it's a big thumb, thumbs up for collaboration. So just to kind of give a, a brief uh, history of uh, my sort of background. So yep, I was a police officer for 30 years. Um, 14 years as a, a roads policing officer. I then went into uh, major crime, uh, became a detective. And then in 2014, 2015, I moved over to, to counter ter terrorism. However, I've been involved in drones for probably about 12 years. Um, I've previously, up until my retirement, been a member of you know various national um, steering groups on drones and counter UIS. Um, collaborated with a number of partners and um, it was certainly great to see Mark again um, and some of the guys online from, from Rogue. Um, and what I kind of found that as I started to put my head above the parapet, certainly in the UK, um, but suddenly I became an expert. Um, and it, it certainly wasn't by any uh, luck or, uh, sorry, by any um, sort of engineering or anything like that. It's just the way it fell because there's an awful lot of inexperience when it comes to uh, counter UIS, digital forensics for drones. Um, and, and and that I think is, you know, is, is quite worrying as, as we start to move forward. Um, and being a small voice, that kind of just accelerated some of the some of the work that I was doing because, you know, reaching out to various people across the UK, there wasn't that many people doing it. Um, I can certainly count on on perhaps one hand. Um, so, you know, I, I'm actually an advocate of, of uh, drones despite the count the UAS um, aspect. Um, I think they've got, you know, great ut utility. Um, and, you know, my, my background actually started as an engineer. So, Prior to me having a rush of blood to the head and, and joining the police, uh, I trained as an engineer, electronics engineer. So that has kind of always been the underlying ripple in uh, as I've progressed. And I think that's naturally how I found myself into uh, just being a geek, being interested in drones. And then suddenly that was applied to, um, to my work life. Um, more recently, since I've retired and had more time, I've become a STEM ambassador. So um, I think it's, a, it's an acronym that's probably used uh, quite widely, but it's science, technology, engineering and, and mathematics um, to inspire the next generation. I think that's really key as well, um, because certainly in the UK, they've recognised that, um, you know, there's a, there's a significant skills gap being, being formed. Um, so I've also recently uh, been appointed as a, an aviation ambassador for the UK government. Um, so one of the things I want to start doing is trying to, you know, get some grassroots interest uh, going into in the UK in drones uh, and certainly counter UAS and see what some of these bright young minds uh, can bring to the table. So if there's anything that, um, you know, the people in the network 
think could uh, could assist me in doing that, then I'd be very much interested in uh, in speaking to you. So one of the things that I get or got asked a number of times was, how do we deal with drones? And my answer was always, like many past technology solutions, mitigating hostile drones will require collaboration and convergence of public and private expertise, resources and technology. And I think that's something that um, a lot of the speakers already have, have certainly touched upon, um, because we all know that there is currently no silver bullet when it comes to uh, mitigating drones. Um, and more importantly, and again, you know, I see this a lot or did see it a lot is if you're un unable to understand where the next potential attack can come from, then you shouldn't be surprised if you can't defend yourself against it. So there's got to be a clear understanding of what your threat is, um, what the art of the possible is, um, and, you know, being under being in a position to actually understand how you can mitigate against that. Bottom line, as we all know, drones are, you know, going to be here for uh, a very long time, whether used for good or bad, and they're just going to be featured more and more in our lives. Um, so the bits I'm just going to kind of touch on is um, around digital forensics and, and some of the stuff that uh, we did in the UK. Um, some bit I'm going to kind of gloss over because um, a lot of it are cases that are still ongoing, there's still investigations ongoing and what have you, but it's just to kind of give uh, a brief flavour and hopefully open the floor up to uh, some questions later on, um, as long as Gatwick isn't mentioned. Um, so the majority of the work uh, being undertaken by county UAS teams initially, I believe, focus their attention on the generic threat and mitigation from a UAV incident. So. All the um, all the effort, if you like, is generally put into right. How can we stop it? You know what our response procedures are, and so on and so forth. The the resulting bit on if we don't stop it or we do, the next natural progression is well, what do we do with it? And that's where sometimes um, it, it, it catches us out, or certainly can do. Um, so. When I started this work, it was re recognised that the next progressive step following a nefarious drone incident, which had been mitigated against, will be the subsequent investigation. And this is where I see the uh, an awful lot of skill fade um, happening. Um, this is, you know, particularly important following the uh, physical recovery of a of a UAS. Um, so the work that I started actually started in 2015 here in the UK. Um, and it was to establish new ways of technically exploiting uh, recovered drones. Um, and this came about as a, a number of high profile press reportings and you know you can you can Google them and this is well before we got to uh, the airport incidents. There was an awful lot of uh, bad press around people flying uh, contraband into into prisons. Um, and I see there being a lot of similarities, whether you're conveying and dropping uh, contraband, something quite inert like, you know, cannabis, mobile phones, whatever, um, to drop in, as Mark has illustrated, uh, munitions and, and other stuff more, uh, which is of more concern. But the actual, you know, methods of doing that are uh, very similar. And certainly the investigative side uh, can be very similar as well. Um, so what we looked at um, was that there was a significant number of drones uh, that had been recovered over the best part of about 18 months. None of them had been technically exploited. So um, they kind of got put into the perhaps too difficult to deal with bin, um, the not really sure how to deal with it. Um, so we had you know, a lot of the drones were being put through wet forensics, so DNA, fingerprinting, and et cetera. But that's kind of where it stops because they just thought, oh, it's just a drone, it's just a toy, we're not going to get anything out of it. Um, so I had a bit of a challenge on my hand to go through all of those drones, and we're talking double figures, um, and, and start to extract all of that data and find ways of uh, actually 
extracting that data and establishing what is going to be relevant to an investigation and how we can use some of those analytics and those artifacts from the data um, into an evidential product. Because it's all very well just saying, well, I've got this data and it looks really nice. We've got to put it into a format that, you know, as I'm sure you're aware if we're presenting to a court with um, 12 members of the jury that might range from, you know, um, a gymnast to, you, to your granny, um, they may never have seen a drone before. So it's got to be put into terms that the layman can understand um, and, you know, for you to get that prosecution across the line. Um, so we um, started to look at that and that was obviously shared and opened up um, another number of opportunities to um, give input into national guidance documents and and also international guidance documents so i mean again i'm just going to rough and kind of go through this because i think most of you be aware of this obviously we've got the aircraft aircraft controller uh, associated tablets and phones and again when i draw on that that is a massive thing that's being missed out. Um, you know, I get sent a number of drones and they say, right, we've got the drone, great. Uh, did the suspect have a mobile phone on him? Well, yeah, but he wasn't flying that. No, but that's that's another source of data. Um, and it might be a source of data that whilst we've got this drone in front of us here, then he might or she might have access to a number uh, of others that they're doing the various activity on um, and there's a chance that all of that data is is on uh, mobile phones so that's something that I've seen um, is missed quite quite often as I'm sure you all know uh, able to establish where it took off from where it landed flight path time and day um, some of the stuff that I've started to do over here is um, around the the motors um, how fast are the motors spinning, the pitch and yaw of the aircraft, obviously. And from some of those analytics, you can actually draw conclusions or suggestions of whether the device was actually carrying a payload on its ingress and it didn't have a payload attached on its egress. Um, and although that's not an exact science, it can, in certain bits of data that I've looked at, give an indication and that relates to, let's say, how fast the motors were spinning, um, what the current drain on the battery is. So if it's under heavy load going in, but a lighter load coming out, then you can draw the conclusion um, that the uh, the aircraft was under under load, um, putting aside weather and, uh, you know, gusts of wind and everything like that. Um, and obviously we start to look at um, you know, registered uh, information on on who the owner might be, um, and also we've done a lot of work on uh, batteries. They are absolutely amazing sources of intelligence and information. Um, so we're able to link individual uh, batteries to other recovered devices. So if we get a device recovered and six months later we get another one um, and they've both shared the same battery, then obviously you've got a commonality there um, with an indication that it may be the same group operating the, the same drone, even if it's in uh, different locations in the UK. So it, it, it starts to form quite a good intelligence picture around that as well. Um, so this is just a spoofed incident, it's, it's not a real flight, but that is very, very typical of, of what we've seen in uh, in prisons over here in the UK. It's your typical um, picking a rural prison where most of ours are. I think we've got about 140 prisons in the UK. Uh, the majority of those are rural um and quite easy to access from um you know from the fields and what have you and then we get that typical ingress and and egress flight um sometimes multiple flights on uh, the same day same time uh, they just keep on hot swapping batteries um so when we start to strip some of that uh, data out like i say what we've got is historically we just look used to look at the flights so yeah we can see where they took off from and where they um Enter the prison and where they they came back to but as we start to delve into some of that data that's collected on the black boxes we can start to draw um, a lot of other information from that um, so you can start to see your typical uh, flight profile so we start to understand 
well, how do they come into the prison? Um, and there's been a number of cases um, where I've actually seen very much the same type of flight. So although it might be a different prison or it's the same prison on a different day, you can almost recognise uh, as sad as it might be the individual client, the individual flight characteristics of a particular pilot. So you can almost see where there's a different pilot involved because they will enter the prison or conduct that kind of um, ingress and egress flight uh, quite differently to somebody else. So being able to profile that um, and also looking at the stick inputs, how they um, do the stick inputs, you know, are they quite fluid in that? Are they rough in their movement? Will also give an indication on um, their experience as well, which again does uh, had an impact for uh, when it comes to presentation of court. Um, so the data inside them is uh, is absolutely uh, amazing, and I'm, I continue to see new trends that we can find with that. So um, as we all know, locations of data sources are typically your onboard flash, uh, micro SD. That was um, very useful for some of the early DJIs prior to them going over to uh, EMMC. Um, we've obviously got external micro SD, uh, the remote control, again, as I said, connected, recovered mobile devices, and also uh, under warranty, or if you can get access to um, a home computer or something like that, then you know, got access to their cloud accounts um, through such services as, as DJI or indeed any other um, manufacturer that, that provides that, um, that capability. So when we look at the forensic process for a drone, um, if you don't get the bits right at the beginning, then everything else can fall, uh, fall apart. Um, so the initial forensic recovery and packaging and assessment is, is absolutely critical. Um, again, you know, I've had drones brought into me in in various uh, states, um, which makes a difference when you know you could do the best job in the world on um, the forensic analysis and the you know the presentation of evidence. However, if that gets to court and there's no continuity of the evidence at the very beginning, then that's it. The whole lot absolutely fails. So it's understanding what your uh, procedures are for recovery, uh, packaging, and obviously uh, continuity as well. Absolutely key. Uh, we then go into obviously the forensic acquisition of data um, to establish what is available. Uh, because one of the challenges, again, as we as we see um, data, and this is you know the same with mobile phones. Under in UK law, we have something called uh, disclosure. I think the Americans have uh, something uh, very similar, which I can't remember the name of. Um, exculpatory evidence, I think you call it. Um, as data gets bigger, obviously it becomes more of a challenge because you've got to be able to present that and say, I'm not holding back on anything. So when you're starting to you know, talk uh, gigabytes or terabytes of data, that becomes a, a quite a significant challenge to make sure that you've disclosed everything and uh, you've looked at every element of data to so either prove or indeed disprove an offence because it, it sits, the onus is on us both ways. We've got to prove or disprove an offence. Um, so, yeah, es establishing all of that data is critical. Uh, as a recovery of any other media um, or metadata and also establishing owner and attribution, particularly when uh, we just get a drone and we don't know where it's come from, who it belongs to, we obviously need to um, need to be able to look at that. So some of the um, challenges that we've sort of identified is one of the bits I look at is the main difficulty with drone forensic is that there are various ways to obtain evidence from the devices whilst ensuring forensic integrity um, and I think you know commercially when you look at some of the vendors um, it comes down to the likes of us you um, to reverse engineer um, and to you know try to find out where that data is hidden um, in an ideal world the the drone vendors when they produced a uh, new device you know the DJI, Mavic 3, whatever you want, um, that, you know, for police and law enforcement, they actually give access and say, right, do you know what, this is, 
this is what we're capturing and this is how you get hold of it and this is how it can be beneficial to you um, because I think that will cut down a lot of the learning that we have to do because you know we've seen the the rate that technology is now advancing um, I've still got one of the the original map uh, sorry one of the original phantoms the phantom one um, and where you look at from where we were then to where we are now um, the data is just you know exponentially exploded um, and as has the complexity so by the time we kind of go through that learning loop that it might take six months to a year to reverse engineer understand the platform really start to dig into the data what happens a new one comes out um, and you know criminals are very adaptive uh, and very smart um, when we looked at uh, or sorry when geofencing was was introduced over here all of our prisons were ge geofenced and i saw a um a shift in in the type of platforms being used so at one point and it you know pretty much happened very very quickly um the majority of platforms being used were were phantom threes absolutely great geofencing went in so uh, they either shifted away from dji or rolled back uh, to a previous version, Phantom 2, something like that. So actually mapping that kind of data um, is is critical. And seeing one of the other presentations on uh, on trends, you know, the, the the sort of market share, if you like, um, I think we need to do that for the criminal and nefarious use of drones because that's how we can understand and almost predict why are people going to this particular platform. Um, so not only for market analysis, but also you know for black market analysis, if you like, um, to get a, a, a true understanding of that. Um, and like I say, you know, constant update and, and releases of new models and and firmware. So you know, DJI will. Um, change their firmware to you know block vulnerabilities or whatever and that may be the difference between us being able to extract data or, or having to start that cycle again and add more delays and, and so on and so forth and also it's the high cost of drones to to be able to conduct that research um you know we haven't got a, an infinite supply of drones um but like i say you know if the if manufacturers were able to give us that that introduction and then Gives access to the data, tear down tools, whatever they have, then you know that'd be um, that'd be absolutely awesome. So, just to illustrate the you know the three steps really, um, we looked at the ensuring the correct safe and forensic recovery procedures are complied with for police and other security services and security partners, um, and more importantly, ensuring the right training is in place as well. Um, cops over here have a uh, awful lot on their plate, um, multi-skilled, having to deal with you know a whole variety of things. Um, the chance of them coming across a drone incident is probably fairly rare at the moment, um, but it is becoming more prevalent the more drones that we get to see. So we've got to ensure that the uh, the training is training is in place for. Uh, officers to to deal with that. I think the younger generation probably understand technology better than the older. Um, but again, it is across the board because you can guarantee you will be the only one that gets sent to recover a drone. And if that's the first time you've seen what one looks like, then um, I think you're facing a, a bit of an uphill struggle. Um, continuity, as I said, is is imperative, cradle to grave. You know, where is that drone? come from, who has handled it, where has it been, uh, and where has it got to. Um, and then we look at the investigation and the intelligence, and that's where I see the you know the significant skill gaps being being created because you've got investigators that um, are used to normal uh, human investigations, if you like, you know, um, involving uh, violence or you know drugs or, or whatever it is as soon as technology comes into that um, and they get handed you know a bundle of papers with 150 flights on it or something then generally what I'm saying is they don't have the skills to to interpret that so um, I came up with a format of a report that's gone through the courts over here a, a number of times I've examined um, probably 250 drones in, in the UK that have been recovered from prisons. So we've got quite um, a good process on how the evidence should be presented in court. Um, and thankfully, we haven't had 
uh, many that are challenged. So that comes from the defence side of things, that even the defence aren't um, particularly clued up, I would suggest, on on how to defend somebody that's being prosecuted for uh, a drone incident. So now being an ex-cop, I can sit either side of the fence um, and uh, play play devil's advocate, if you like. Um, so it's you know it's ensuring that the right things are done. Um, the analytics for corner of the crime, submissions for technical exploitations, and also what does that central data look like? And like I say, seeing uh, the previous. Uh, presentation, understanding seasonal trends of, um, you know, nefarious activity, absolutely critical. Why are people flying over certain times? If we get a, a baseline of activity, then anything outside of that that might look odd, that gives you your focus to go and look at that and think, right, is that a nefarious actor? Um, just, you know, undertaking some uh, practice flights and and so on and so forth. So whilst the data is coming in, you're packaging it up and presenting it for court, I think that that data, whilst you've got hold of it, is very rich in other areas. And the more that you acquire, the bigger that picture uh, will become. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know many um, states or uh, agencies that, that are actually doing that. We, we don't have one central part of data um, as much as I would like us to because in five years time we can look back at that and almost you know certainly uh, project forward as well around around certain trends and predictive analysis and like i say the final thing is the you know the challenges of of getting stuff across the line um with the courts uh we need to ensure that there are changes in law um to make sure that there's consistent sentencing um but also ensure that there's legislation in place to prosecute people because generally legislation comes after an event um, so you know we've seen uh, significant changes in in UK law since the events of 2018 had that not happened then I don't think the laws would be where they are today and that obviously causes a rift with uh, some of the you know the people that want to fly drones uh, legitimately because they see law as being uh, an, a, a hindrance uh, to their enjoyment but at the end of the day if you you know my view of it is that if you're doing nothing wrong you've got nothing to worry about but the laws have got to be in place um, to be able to prosecute people when uh, wrongdoing is um, is undertaken um, and also it's training with legislators it's training with um, crown prosecutors uh, judges you know so they really get to understand what this problem uh, looks like um, and you know bringing advocates and and those sort of people into these sort of seminars so they can understand that there is perhaps help out there and also to understand how quickly this is advancing um i think that's critical as well despite how busy uh, i'm i'm sure they all are so this one kind of is uh i want to open that up to the floor when we go to the uh the question side is what is the current and future threats? What does it actually look like from the world of digital forensics? Um, I, there was a couple of slides that I was going to put into this, but I decided to hold back on them just because of um, some other work that's uh, been uh, been done in the UK. Um, but it's it's around what are criminals looking at, and it's very much, you know, when Mark spoke about. Uh, red teaming against uh, county UAS systems. Where is that being collated? What is there out there? What is it that we can do as a community um, to tinker with stuff and say, do you know what? I wonder if that's possible. I wonder if we can, you know, start to fall the county UAS systems. Um, how easy is it? How accessible is that from technology? Um, I've seen stuff online and I've seen it uh, used live in the UK um, where people are defeating counter UAS systems um, and these are low level actors and I say they're low level because they're the type of people that fly drugs and contraband into prisons um, so having come across those many times they're not always um, the most 
um, academically challenged people in the in the world. Um, you know, they've got drug habits, they're trying to play off a debt. So this is the activity that they decide to undertake. So they're low level actors, but they're actually achieving high sophistication of uh, mitigation against counter UAS systems. So if that's accessible to them, then, you know, what else is out there? And I think to be able to understand that and feed that back into the counter UAS uh, vendors to say, look, have you thought about this? You know, this is what we're starting to see. How can we plug some of these gaps? Because I think some of them probably could be quite easily pluggable uh, once we understand what the uh, what the true art of the possible is. So that's one just for uh, a little bit later. Um, as we said, you know, data analytics that um, I was looking at is what type of drones are we seeing um, in in different contexts? And I know the presentation on Embry Riddle again um, highlighted that. But again, you know, from a nefarious point of view, um, around prisons or, or whatever, what type of drones are we seeing that are conducting uh, bad missions? And it's it's no great surprise. Um, this slide deck is um, probably a couple of years old now, but you can see that, you know, as soon as the Phantom 3 hits the hit the market, we saw a massive increase in, uh, in their use for flying contraband into prisons, um, purely because they're, you know, they're absolutely awesome at, at carrying probably about one kilo of weight, uh, 900 grams to a kilo, um, very easy to fly, um, and, and they just did the job. So, you know, why would we perhaps concentrate some of our counter US um, techniques on uh, something like a uh, Typhoon Unique when we only see them as singular figures? You know, tracking that trend as it goes through uh, the months and years um, helps to inform where do we need to concentrate our efforts on as opposed to, you know, a kind of wide net that might not actually capture much um so tracking that kind of data for us certainly from uh prisons was uh was very important um and just a final thought from me and hopefully open up um, a couple of questions is that you know one of the things i've looked at criminals and nefarious actors are highly adaptive motivated and innovative and will continue to find new ways to support uh ocg's organized crime group activities, spread fear and chaos. It's imperative that agencies continue planning a robust response to the threat, not only in terms of detection and countermeasure technology, but also the training necessary to, to defend against nefarious drones and also how to pursue and investigate. So this isn't just about you know the digital forensics, the tearing down the ones and the zeros and producing the report with um, you know lots of pr pretty graphs. It's the whole thing. It's the whole wrap around, uh, like I say, cradle to grave. Where do we go from having the drone incident all the way taking it through to a court? Because if we don't get the the basics right at the beginning, it's never going to get to the end. And what we'll see is just the same people undertaking, uh, undertaking the same activity time and time again. Um, and that is what they do up until the point they get they got, they get caught. Um, and it was a very good point that somebody made uh, a little while ago around the the cost of UAS. You know, if you're carrying um, ten thousand dollars worth of contraband, the the fact that you're going to lose a five hundred pound drone is is you know neither here nor there. So they almost become disposable assets. And whilst they continue to dispose of them. It's an opportunity for us. So long may they continue to uh, crash, uh, push the boundaries of what they're trying to achieve, and give us the opportunity to uh, go out and catch the bad guys, essentially. So that's um, that's about it. Hopefully, there's um, there's a few few questions. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll get your screen uh, removed, which now I can see you so we can actually talk to each other properly. But um, thank you very much, Stephen. It was really, really interesting. Um, some of those insights around the battery intelligence and so forth uh, just always is, is super interesting. So um, and, and something I just wanted to say based on your comment there around, you know, the, the drones dropping, you know, X amount of contraband and being worth, you know, more and more. You know, there's that, and I think it was you who mentioned at one point, you know, the economics of if they've done multiple drops with a certain amount of, of contraband, you know, 
how much is that actually costing the organization? It's almost a way of, of saying, well, if your countermeasure system costed 250K, but a drone's made 25 deliveries of a 10K payload, you know, you're almost actually balancing out that ROI. It can be super interesting. And that can only be found out by forensics, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can you can start to put figures on that. Um, you know, there's various uh, figures out there that says, you know, for a typical um, weight of a drug or whatever, um, you know, cigarettes, contraband, whatever it is in prison, its value normally triples, uh, if not more. Um, so it becomes a very valuable commodity. But if you look at, you know, some of the problems that we, we had in the UK around uh, spice and some of the more toxic um, narcotics, you know, people are becoming unwell in hospital, uh, sorry, in prison. So what happens? They need to be taken to hospital. You've got a prisoner going to hospital, well, they can't go on their own, so they're going to need two prison guards with them. They need to arrange the transport. So suddenly a simple problem of somebody just flying drugs into uh, prison becomes exponentially increased when you start to add the various values onto that. And we're not even getting into the instability that that might cause to the, you know, the regime inside the prison around, um, you know, people, people being on drugs. Um, so, you know, the, the economic impact is, is quite significant. No, that's incredible. And, you know, it's amazing to hear you worked on over 250 drones as extracting that data. There's a question here which says, um, what are the key actual tools that you use to conduct your forensics? Um, I mean, you may or may not be able to disclose this, but what are, what are some of the yeah, tools? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I've seen um, some of the various uh, push button digital forensic tools uh, where you plug a drone in um, and it, it it just spits out 5,000 pages of, of reports, um, you know, for a digital forensics examiner, that's great because then you can just give that to the investigator and go, I'll leave you for the next six months to read through that. Um, I tend to come, to come at things at a slightly different level. Um, so I tend not to use the push button uh, uh, digital forensic tools too much. So I use DATCOM, some of those sort of tools. Um, and I very much tailor the report. So although a, t uh, a technical exploitation report that I do is normally around 120 pages, so there's a lot of work that goes into it, but there's normally a forensic strategy. So I normally ask the investigators, what is it you want to prove? What is it we're trying to achieve here? Because I can tell you X, Y, and Z, but if it's of absolutely no relevance, then why would I spend time doing that? And that's where some of the push button forensics at, um, you know, actually enters into that trap that an investigator will get a 5,000 page report. They won't even know where to start. Yeah. Give them a, you know, a one or two page summary of a, a particular flight. Um, and that that's ample, you know, so pictures tell a thousand words, I think. Um, and like I say, it's not just the investigators that we've got to illustrate that evidence to. It's also prosecutors and ultimately a court uh, where there's, you know, civilian jurors that might have absolutely zero technical experience and certainly may never have okay. seen a drone so it's got to be in a format that's readable and and easily to to understand yeah absolutely that one picture of the you know the voltage and the battery life and the rotors increasing in rpm or decreasing in rpm because a payload has been dropped is just really simple to understand and you can see it from there something came off that drone and it, it changed all those factors very quickly yeah um, that's it there's a follow-up question on on that which is the black box analysis and it's have you come across any anti-forensics or scrubbing of onboard or external flight logs so far um no except for one um and that's where somebody was smart enough uh, just to remove the the internal sd card um so the majority of drones that i've seen um there hasn't been any that i haven't got data off of um and it's a it's a valid point because i think again it's another one for for vendors um you know i i advocated with dji some time ago that if um if the internal memory is removable then there's got to be a checking process within the drone that if somebody removes the internal sd card the drone doesn't fly because why would a legitimate person want to take out um the the black box data recorder so again it's trying to influence um manufacturers of how they can make their products not only safer 
but also make it easier for investigators and um, you know to to be able to investigate the offences, but make it harder for nefarious actors to to hide what they're actually doing. Um, and those sort of, sort of simple measures, I think, need to need to come across more. Mm, okay, and you mentioned um, you know the change from those Phantom Threes over to another type of drone when geofences uh, were brought on. Uh, can you detect? In your forensics when a system is being rooted or modded to bypass no-fly zones or with custom firmware things like that is that easy to pick up yeah so it is. so you can do uh check some runs on the uh the actual firmware that's that's running so within the flight logs you can generally see uh what version of firmware is being run you can do a firmware dump off of the aircraft um and compare that to the hash values of a, a confirmed for firmware. So yes, once you get the firmware off, you can you can tear that down. Um, the majority of the investigations over here are literally, you know, people flying in um, into prison. So we don't thankfully have to go into into too much depth because it's a sledgehammer to crack them up. If they're flying in drugs, that's enough to put them in prison without kind of going down the routes of where they were bypassing G offensing and what have you. Okay, keeps it nice and simple, I think. I like simple. I like simple. <laughs> that, that's right. Uh, there's another question here, which is um, Can mobiles only be examined if the operator is apprehended presently flying the drone or by post warrant? No, so it can be, um, it can be post warrant, post recovery. So, um, again, we've had a number of cases where, you know, we might get the drones and through uh, fingerprinting or other methods of attribution, we obviously, you know, um go and do a door knock um a house search conducts your phones are recovered um the data if they're running uh flight apps a number of flight apps um the data is generally sitting on the phone so like i say that is another key point because if we get drone recoveries that um give us entry to the house but we don't we only know that one incident the phone might actually indicate well actually they've had access to a number of other drones and have conducted another you know number of other drops um, and, and more intelligent so i think when we look at um drone forensics i've always said the flight system you know we should be having the whole of the flight system if it's available so aircraft controller and then the associated uh, ancillary equipment uh, ground control stations computers so on and so forth uh, just to give you that full picture yeah, you can almost imagine, you know, depending on their SOP, someone takes the battery out of the drone to provide that to you, leaves the battery out, and then you don't get all that uh, really great data. So um, interesting question actually on that is, you know, can commercial entities or, sorry, it says here, can private industry do analysis on drones for their own organization if a drone lands in their perimeter, or do they have to call LE to do that analysis? Um, hmm, interesting one. Um, I think it depends on on local laws. Um, over here, if if you find something and you don't make reasonable steps to you know find its owner, then um, it can be constituted as theft, theft by finding. Um, I think the first protocol is you know if you do find a drone in your environment, um, particularly if it's a security environment, you'd want to ask why is it there and i think you know different uh different countries different police states so on and so forth would have different processes um you know there's nothing to stop you perhaps looking at the data if it if it was accessible i'll say i'll, I'll be guided by whatever local laws are um but yeah if you if if you find one if you make reasonable attempts to find its owner or indeed you know you can if the police aren't interested in taking it in as fine property yeah. then you know you'd be looking at the data to perhaps find the owner so that's another way of looking at it mm. the obligatory i'm not a lawyer so that's all fine <laughs> um look there's one last question which i'll ask because we're about to go into a, a short break um and that is in terms of registered owners tracking you had a slide on it um have you determined have you determined buying and selling hacked DJI accounts online or if that affects finding the registered owner of drone? No, I'm aware, I am aware of that, um, that, that that is a thing. Um, I think in, in general terms, the majority of the data that we can get off the UAS is enough often to give us a point of attribution. 
Um, there's not many that I've had where we've said mm, we don't actually know who's doing that. Um, but again, you know, the hacked DJI account, you normally will need, uh, unless somebody wants to tell me otherwise, uh, you normally need the handset. Um, you know, to see what the, the UUID, et cetera, is. So that's not generally stored uh, on the aircraft. So unless you get that mobile phone and then that gives you another line of inquiry because generally there should be other data on that phone that I think would be of more benefit than a than a hacked DJI account. Mm, okay, super interesting. Well, Stephen, what I might do is, do you have any kind of last comments or kind of future outlooks on the, the drone forensics industry in the next few years? um no nothing specific sorry i've just pushed the button and lost you there we go um <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> no nothing nothing specific i think you know as i said there's there's work ongoing around um how we can red team against counter uas systems um and i think that's really keen uh or i'm really keen to hear other people's thoughts on that because if we can do it, other people can. Um, so I think as drones become more prevalent and as uh, legislation becomes slightly tighter and there's more counter UAS systems, criminals will naturally start thinking outside the box around how can they get get around it. Up until recently, there was no you know DTI or anything, so they they knew that they could carry on without fear of uh, of being detected now that's starting to happen that's going to push them i think into a particular uh, particular area to start thinking well how do we now act smarter um and that's the loop that we need to be involved in you know to to understand ourselves mm -hmm. you know what is the art of the possible brilliant well it was super interesting thank you for uh, being part of the gdsn this time and look forward to having you back again